Yeah. Well, wait a minute. Okay, I see you. Start the recording. So I may, just for your information, um, I may pop in and out as far as, because I'm, uh, um, you know, got my got my kids with me. So it's not a problem. But yeah, that's not a problem. That's no big deal at all. Okay, it looks like we are recording. And you said yeah. you can see my screen. Yeah, I can see it. All right, cool. So uh, just to introduce you, Sean, uh, to the people that sub to my channel, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Sean Williams. And as you can see here, he's got a YouTube channel, a very nice one. You can see just by looking at him that he's a very smart, young black man. And <laughs> my, my subbers know that I'm a very dumb ugly old man so <laughs> we've got a good a good balance here going sean uh, and so i appreciate you joining me today and i got a simple question i kind of want to start off with and that is what must i do to be saved yeah well yeah to be saved um one must believe on the gospel so whatever is packaged in the gospel is going to be the substance in which saves a person. So that gospel being that Christ came, died for our sins, and was risen or rose by God. So, you know, Paul says that he was delivered for our offenses and was raised for our justification. So I believe having faith in that is what cleanses us, washes us. The fact that he shed his blood for our sins, which was the only thing that can ever get anybody cleansed, um, is what saves a person. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can you hear them dogs barking? Yeah, I can hear it. <laughs> yeah, they like to bark over there. I so, hear. yeah, so Romans 4, verse 25, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again, for our justification right. right so it's not uh we're not justified by what we did but by the finished works of jesus christ on the cross would you agree oh most definitely yeah yeah so i appreciate that and um so like on my uh on my channel sean i get people that want to say that uh, I'm not sure what what that is, but I get people saying uh, things like, um, "Well, what happens if you are saved and then you sin after you saved? Are you no longer saved? Is that how that works?" Right, right. Yeah. Well, that that tends to be a, a very uh, common thinking, and uh, unfortunately. I would say it's a, a, a misconception because, you know, the Bible clearly states that, you know, if we believe on Christ, that we will never perish and have everlasting life. So you get to a point where once you believe on Christ, you come into a point where death is no longer an option for you, for the believer. And uh, Peter actually describes that, um, that when we are born again, we're born again out of corruptible seed, but of an incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth in the body forever. So one of the things I kind of like to put out there is that if you're born of something incorruptible, then you being the offspring of that, that will also make you incorruptible. So I always, I always question to say, how is it possible for a person to be born of something incorruptible, but yet corrupt, being corrupted again is still an option on the table. So even if a person who is a believer sins again, and the fact of the matter is our soul has been redeemed, our spirit has been resurrected, but you know we are still in this carnal, fleshly body. And there's a war going on, Paul explains in Romans 7 and Galatians 5. Now, the spirit doesn't want what the flesh wants, and the flesh doesn't want what the spirit wants. They're always in conflict with, with one another. 
So in the believer, whenever you're obedient to God, it's because you're being led of the spirit. Whenever you're disobedient, you're being led of the flesh. But in nowhere in scripture do we ever see that when a person has the Holy Spirit, that sin drives out the Holy Spirit. So I tell people, and uh, if I if I start getting too long winded, you could <laughs> you could no. cut me off because I don't want to talk too much. Um, no, you're doing great, Sean. I believe me, they'd rather hear you talk than me fumble. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. I, so in the uh, I tell people in the Old Testament, um, the the tabernacle, the temple uh, that God dwell, dwells in, in the back of the temple which is uh, known as the Holy of Holies, that's where he dwells. And the, uh, the Day of Atonement, when the priests go in to make sacrifice for the nation, the priests themselves had to first atone for their own sins for them to even enter into that place. Because if not, then unfortunately, you know, they will lose their life. So the thing of it is, when I, I tell people this, I say, well, let's make the connection here. You have a temple that God dwells in. If a priest comes in and they haven't atoned for their sins, God doesn't leave. That person, you know, unfortunately they die. Now for the New Testament believer, we are temples of God, temples of the Holy Spirit. And under any circumstance, do we ever see sin driving God out of that temple? So if we are a temple of God, and just like in the Old Testament, we see God dwelling in the temple. Not once do we ever see sin driving God out. So sin, a person, a believer who sins is not going to be able to drive out God, drive out the Holy Spirit. Man cannot break the seal that was placed on all believers, which is of the Holy Spirit. So and the Bible also lets us know that uh, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. So God's not going to be an Indian giver. He's not going to give you something and saying, okay, you're disrespecting my gift. Give it back. No, we have been freely given these things. Now, you know, it's our responsibility to be responsible with these gifts, to um, use these gifts to the glory of God and to serve others. But nowhere in scripture do we ever see that, well, in order to keep these gifts, you know, you have to be, quote unquote, obedient enough. Um, We see once you have the gifts, you have them. And hopefully the the idea is you do what you're supposed to do with them. But still and yet, we don't see anywhere in scripture where God ever takes back a gift. And if we know, according to Romans 6.23, eternal life is a gift of God, you will have to include that in <laughs> gifts that he's not going to take back. So yes, if a person who saves sins, yes, is unfortunate. Um, when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ, those things which abide in the fire, you know, will be, um, get a reward for those things that don't, which I believe are disobedient works of a believer. We're going to lose on, on that reward. But, you know, according to that conversation in Romans, uh, I mean, not Romans, but First Corinthians 3, Paul tells us that you're still going to be saved regardless. So even if you do commit a, a, a disobedient act, regardless, your acts is not what got you saved. It's not what keeps you saved. It's all what Christ did. So your acts, your acts have no bearing on whether or not you get saved or stay saved. So even if you commit an act, you know, you are still considered a child of God. Yeah, that's right. That's well said. I appreciate that uh, very much. Uh, uh, there's no question about it. If you're born of God, um, then you receive that gift from God, and it's not something you take. And because it's not something you take, it's not for yours to give away. Exactly. Right. So it's not, you know. So And also, I like to... Um, I like to, I like this, uh, you know, like the circumcision of the flesh. Maybe uh, right. you could talk a little bit about that. But in the Old Testament, on the eighth day, they would have the child, the male children circumcised to cut off the flesh. Now, uh, that would apply 
to us today, <clears throat> not our not not in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense, where we right. cut off the flesh, our fleshly desires, and we uh, live in the spirit of God. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, yeah, definitely. Um, it's I like how Paul would use Old Testament scenarios and Old Testament figures like Abraham to make his uh, points about current things that were happening in his day. Um, he actually addressed uh, how Abraham, before he was considered uh, righteous, his, his faith was counted as righteousness. He asked a question. He says, was he considered righteous before he was circumcised or after he was circumcised? And the way he, he words it is in circumcision or in circumcision. And he tells um, in Romans 4, I believe, he says how Abraham was considered righteous in uncircumcision. Now, this is the father of Israel. So, and essentially the father, of, you know, of all believers in a spiritual sense. So he says how Abraham was considered righteous even before he did what was understood, what you described as a, a, a seal or a sign of, of faith uh, to God. Even before he did that, he was considered righteous. So, you know, when it comes to circumcision, yes, even though it was something that was to be done, Paul let it be known that he was already declared righteous before he even committed that act. So when it comes to things like circumcision, the whole point is the circumcision that really matters is a spiritual circumcision. Like you described the circ circumcision of the heart as opposed to, to thinking that the outward circumcision is a thing that makes a person, person justified before God. And essentially, Paul was kind of alluding to that fact you all are worried about the outward when it's all about the inward. So when it comes to circumcision, it's all about that spiritual circumcision, that circumcision of the heart. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well said. Uh, appreciate that. And um, so uh, I, what else is there to talk about? It's like baptism. So, um, you know, we're, uh, John came baptizing uh, with water. But mm -hmm. Jesus comes baptizing uh, with fire and with spirit. Right. Um, and so, well, I don't know if I want to go off on a long-winded uh, 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 response oh, to this. Please do. I would love to hear your thoughts, too. <laughs> well, I, I don't really have uh, very coherent thoughts. But so, very, years ago, when I was... Uh, you know, still a learning. I'm still a learning believer, new believer. But years ago, I went to a church and uh, a great big mega church. There's like, uh, I think, 2,000 people there. It was huge. Maybe it was only 1,000. I don't remember. But it doesn't matter. They spent the whole time preaching on the baptism, the water baptism. And they were bringing people up and baptizing them with water. And I thought, that's great. But then I was expecting to hear about the baptism of Jesus, because the baptism of John is, is wonderful and all. It shows uh, your dedication to God, I guess, right? But right. Uh, but what about the baptism of Jesus? And so I had to contact one of the preachers, and the preacher told me, says he says, no, he says, uh, the baptism of Jesus, he... Uh, uh, what, what what is that uh, in uh, Matthew? I think it is about here. Let me look this up because I I'll screw up my words. So yeah, uh, I think it's Matthew three, either two or three. I I come baptizing you with water. But there comes one greater than me whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose. Who will baptize you with fire and with spirit? Does that sound right? Yeah, yeah I think three. it's Matthew 3, yeah. I indeed, okay, he, he says, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with right. fire. And that's right. that's the verse I shared with this gentleman. And he right. said, no, that that baptism is uh, of Satan. And I said, no, 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 that's, 
That's the baptism of being born again, to being baptized into the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he accepted my uh, correction very well. But it, it astonished me that somebody who was a pastor of over a thousand people wouldn't understand the difference between the baptism of John and the baptism of Jesus. And I understand the baptism of John sells, uh, you know, makes a lot of money for the church. Because they, you know, they're bringing in people and they're baptizing, sprinkling them with water and all that stuff. But the real baptism that matters is the baptism of Jesus, and that is being born again, being baptized into the body of Christ. Uh, is that something you would agree with? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, you know, when John talks about there's one who's going to come greater than I, whose sandals I'm not even worthy to unlatch. You know, he's he's letting them know, hey, this prophecy is about to come to pass. You know, this this awaited Messiah is about to actually be on the scene that, you know, we've all been been kind of waiting for. Um, so when he when he talks about to say, hey, you know, I only baptize with water. You know, I can't from my understanding, you know, John was a very revered person, you know, um, among uh, the the Jewish people. But John is letting it be known to say, you know, there's one that's going to come that, you know, you think, you know, my baptism is something, the one who's going to come, he's actually going to baptize you like for real. Is You're going to, you know, you're actually going to get that that eternal life when he comes on the scene and you believe in him. So, yes, um, you know, I definitely, you know, would agree that, you know, that the baptism of Christ is the thing that, you know, from Christ, him, him coming in is what, you know, gets a person, you know, washed and renewed. Right. Yeah, right. Exactly. And so, um, you know, I actually had a woman tell me, if I haven't been water baptized, I haven't been saved. And I uh, was uh, doing some business, so I didn't want to get in a long discussion with this lady. But, uh, boy, that would be a terrible thing because, like, the, there's two guys on the cross with Jesus. And I thought that exact. And I, I always give that same example, too. I, I ask people, I say, so is there, if the, if the thief was saved, and I said, you know, did he get taken off, baptized, and get hung back up? You know, if yeah. if if it's a requirement like that. Yeah, that, that's that's uh, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, so I mean, he there wasn't Jesus didn't say, you know, he didn't make any uh, requirement, if you will, any sort of caveat. He just said, "Today shalt thou be with me in paradise," and the right. reason was is because he he believed. In Jesus and the other guy didn't and so that's sort of the conflict that we all have we can look to the man that doesn't believe in Jesus or we can you know be the one that does believe in Jesus right we have we have that choice right so yeah I've heard people preach on that as well and uh, there's a lot to be said just about the two guys on the cross right yeah and I, I feel uh I feel like, you know, the Bible gives like like snapshots of like things we could look at. I don't know if you call it uh like what's it called typology um where you can see scenarios actually kind of speak to, you know, the actual redemption of of men and I feel like that is a good snapshot to say you got two people, two type of people in this world. Those who believe and those who reject. Yep, exactly. Yep, it's pretty simple, right? I mean, it's really mm. not even not complicated at all. And, uh, you know, it's like uh, there's a favorite verse that I have. Uh, let's see if I can pull it up here. Uh, something about uh, the law of the Lord is perfect. And for some reason, my... And you're still there, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, I'm still uh -oh. here. Okay. Okay, so go something. If for what, whatever reason, it won't pull up, but it, it's something to the effect that the law of the Lord is perfect, 
making the simple wise uh, converting the soul. I wish I had it because I can't remember nothing. But anyways, uh, the law the, the law is perfect, and right. so it's simple. Right. And this thing keeps spinning. I don't know why. I should have a better out here. So, and there's also another. Let's let me try this one more time. Because I always butcher verses, and I. Okay. There we go. I might be getting something. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So this uh, really appeals to me because I consider myself uh, very simple. And but the word of the um, the the word of God is um, brought me a lot of uh, understanding and a lot of peace. And in that sort of sense, uh, I'm wise in the sense that I understand. Uh, peace and i have peace in my heart because of so much knowledge of the word of god so much knowledge from god right. and there's also another another verse here uh i think it's paul that's warning um but i fear lest by any means that as the serpent beguiled eve so should your minds let me read the verse here. But I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And so I think that scenario on the cross with two men, one believed and one didn't, that's that's as simple as it gets, right? Right. right. Yeah. So uh, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I'm not, okay. Yeah, 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 you know, I, um, I just recently, um, did a video about Adam and Eve, and I basically was making the, the parallel of man's attempt to keep themselves alive versus God keeping man alive. So, you know, I heard someone, they, they, there was someone who believes that you can lose salvation and they just quickly kind of just threw it out there. They said, well, you know, Adam and Eve, you know, they fell. And I think the point they were trying to make was they came from a perfect state. Just like, you know, we all believe when you come to Christ, you're, you know, made perfect, you know, in your spirit. And, but then they say, but they still fail. So, in the video, I basically said how God told Adam and Eve they could eat of any tree but the one that was in the midst of the garden, the, knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. As soon as they ate that tree, he said, you would die um, therein in that day. So literally, man had to work to keep themselves alive. The moment they did something disobedient, they fell. Now, they didn't drop dead right then and there physically, but they did spiritually fall. So if you kind of take that and compare it to if you believe you have to do works or be obedient, quote unquote, enough in order to stay saved, well, you already see what happened with Adam and Eve. Exactly. If you're saying that you have to be good enough well man has already proven that they can't do it so literally if and i think that all you know it talks to that free will that god gives it's like either you can obey me and live or disobey and die so the moments and and i think that's another conversation that um you know you try to have with people who believe that you can lose it you ask them well you know, how many sins does it take? You know, how, you know, how long are you in sin before you do lose it? And nine times out of 10, they will say, well, they don't know, you know, they don't have any scripture to show. But if we, if we were to use Adam and Eve as a way to kind of speak to that, well, according to what happened to them, all it took was one time and they failed immediately. They didn't have to live in sin, quote unquote. 
they didn't have to commit a very heinous crime to say, wow, they somebody committed murder or something like that. No, they simply ate up a tree that God told them not to eat. I'm pretty sure we would say, well, that's bad. But we probably wouldn't think that that was bad enough to quite merit losing salvation, so to speak. But we see that they fail off of that. So if a person could fall, the moment they do anything outside of God's standard, that would be it. That's why the blood of Christ is so necessary to abstain us from that sin. Yes, sir. Exactly. Exactly. And what, you know, the way I like to say it sometimes is, you know, like the example you gave, Adam and Eve were in the garden and they failed. So now God threw them out of the garden and told them to populate the earth. And so I contend there was billions of people living at the time before the flood. And all these people were living hundreds of years. And they had everything that they could ever ask for. And they mm-hmm. still screwed it up big time. Yeah. And so... Yeah, uh, and you know, example after example. Uh, so God gave them the law, and they still screwed it up. Yeah. And so, example after example, man can't do it on his own. He was given every opportunity to do it on his own, and he can't do it. And so, I would even contend when Jesus is talking to like the young rich man, he says. Uh, the young rich man says, what must I do to be saved? And, he, and Jesus says, uh, <clears throat> well, you know the commandments, uh, you know, thou yeah. shalt not kill, thou shalt not, yeah. and so forth. And he says, well, all these have I kept since my youth. Yeah. And Jesus says, that will be perfect. Then sell all that you have, uh, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. I mean, th- that was not even, I mean, the law. Even if you're perfect in the law, you're still not perfect in God's eyes. And the, so the young man, he, he couldn't do it. He realized he couldn't do it, so he just ended up walking away. And that goes to show you that nobody can do it on their own, no matter how good they think they are. Does that, make, does that sound right to you? Oh, oh yeah. No, I, <laughs> hey, I definitely agree. And it's, I like how you used uh, the rich young ruler because... To me, it speaks to the mindset of someone who feels that either they don't sin or even if they admit they sin, they still feel like they're good enough that, they're, they, that they are maintaining their own salvation. Because here you have someone when, you know, Christ simply asked, you know, he, he well, the, the, the rich young ruler asked, what must I do? And, and like you said, Christ said, you know, he started listing off these commandments. And the rich young ruler thought he was fine. He, he said, I've been doing that since a youth. But I, I, I like to say, even if he was doing those things from a youth, was he doing it perfectly? Did he ever stray? It's like, I could say, you know, I listen to my parents. But do I always listen to my parents? Do I always do the right thing? You know, Christ says, I believe it's in John 8, um, 29, I want to say. He says, I always do those things which please him, referring to, you know, the father. So even, even if this man felt like, okay, I think I'm pretty good. I, I keep the law. Yeah, but, you know, do you keep it perfectly? And even still, there was an aspect that that man Jesus Christ exposed something in that man that I'm pretty sure that man didn't even consider was sinful against God. You know, I think a lot of times people will go to like the main things that they can think of in their mind. Okay, I don't, I don't, you know, smoke, I don't drink, I don't curse, I don't steal, kill, I don't watch this, I don't do that. But I think to for a person to fathom literally every aspect of life. To say, are you perfect in every single solitary way? I mean, you, I can't think of every single thing to say, is it a sin to do this? Is it a sin to do that? 
And I think that just shows more why we need grace. And that man did not consider something. As soon as Christ brought up his wealth, that was the thing that got him out of there. Yeah. And I feel like Christ did it intentionally, knowing he cared more about his wealth than about God. Because after that, um, you know, Christ says, hardly will anyone rich enter ten, uh, the kingdom of heaven, those, you know, trusting in their riches. He put his trust. It wasn't just for the fact that, well, if you're rich, then that means you're not going to heaven. No. But it was the fact that what did he put his trust in? Christ said, I believe it's in a Matthew account, I want to say, that he says he put his trust in those riches. So, you know, people who, who talk about, you know, losing salvation but feel like they're okay, you know, I would ask to say, have you considered every single aspect of life and are you doing those things all the time perfectly because all it takes is one slip up for you to be considered a transgressor that's right. all it takes exactly so like moses gave us the law thou shalt not kill but jesus says you have heard it old time thou shalt not kill but i say unto you whoever gets angry with his brother without a cause is in danger of the hellfire right and then also mm -hmm. you've heard thou shalt not commit adultery but if you look at a woman lustfully that yeah. has committed adultery in your heart so jesus actually upped the standard he didn't lower yeah. the standard he upped it to show you to to convict to convict uh convince us if you will that we are far from perfect we're not even close and uh, we all need a savior. That's what it, the bottom line, you know, is that we. Yes, yes, need a amen, amen. Yeah, yeah. So excellent, excellent. Uh, yeah, I think it's actually um, in Romans three, where it talks about the the law was given to really shut up the world <laughs> to convict everybody of sin. Yeah. So if someone thinks that, oh, well, I'm good. I'm good enough. I'm good. Well, do you do this? Do you do that? Do you abstain from this? Do you abstain from that? So, you know, people try to use this standard as if it's going to do them justice. And it's the total opposite. This, this standard was just given to show you you're not as good as you think you are. And you need this gift I'm giving you. Yes, but sir. People like to try to use it. You know, maybe, you know, maybe they don't want to admit it. I don't know. But maybe it's some sort of, you know, self pride or self-righteousness to say, hey, I'm, you know, you're not doing what I'm doing. So look, you need to get on the bandwagon with me because I'm on the right path. You're not, you know, and the fact of the matter is none of us is good. <laughs> so. uh, exactly. That's, that's exactly right. And that's interesting that you, you point that out. If you don't mind, I would like to touch on something real quick at the end of John. Uh, you know how you, you, uh, we all deal with people who uh, who like to look at others and say, well, that person's not perfect and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. Yeah. Or what about, yeah. you know, what about it? To me, this is interesting in the very last uh, chapter of John when um, Jesus tells Peter what manner of death he will have. Uh, if I could find it here real quick. And he said... Uh, he said, um, you know, he, it's right after he says, uh, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved. He said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. And then he says, verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou was young, thou girdest thyself and walks whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, Thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This speak mm -hmm. he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he spake, and when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. All right, so now what's interesting is, then Peter, turning about, sees the disciple whom Jesus loved following. Uh, he's, he's talking about John. And Peter says to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? And Jesus said to him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. So it, my interpretation of 
this is don't worry about John. Worry about yourself and follow me. Does that make sense? Yeah, it 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 does. And I never, you know, I'll be honest, you know, um, I'm still learning and studying. So I, I, I didn't even like think about that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So no, I, I actually I, like I how you to. brought that up. See, I just think of it as, uh, you know, like when Jesus is, uh, you know, why do you concern yourself with your brother or the speck that's in your brother's eye when there's a beam in your own eye? And so right. I kind of look at that, you know, because the, a lot of criticism that I get is that people, uh, um, they, they say that uh, I am, they claim that I say that it's okay to sin. And I don't ever say it's okay to sin because you can never, if you can never lose your salvation, well, then you can just go sin and all you want. And so yeah. these people are saying that I'm, promoting hearsay and they they call it a damnable doctrine mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i'm not saying it's ever okay to sin i've never said right. that right but it's interesting because it, to me it looks like these people are looking to everybody else and not looking at their own you know right. shortcomings if you will does that make sense yeah um, it 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 does and um you know i like when I read scripture, you know, I read how man, man can, we can only see the outward. So if, if we are trying to, if we're trying to judge what we believe is in a person's heart, we're going to listen to what they say, how they act, how they, how they live their lives. But the fact of the matter is, when we look at scripture, we see that God is the only one who can actually read and see a person's heart. So you can have someone who seemingly walks the walk, talks the talk, and lo and behold, guess what? You thought they were a believer, and they're not. And I always love to give the example of Judas. You know, when Christ said that there was, you know, someone in the midst of them uh, who was going to, you know, betray him, someone who was a devil, ironically, all of the apostles started questioning themselves. You know, no one said, oh, we know who it is. It's Judas. We already know. No, they literally started questioning themselves to say, are we going to be the ones to betray you, Lord? And lo and behold, it was Judas. And I tell people, I say, well, why, you know, if, if you can look at a person and just automatically say, okay, yeah, I know that person saved, then why weren't the apostles able to see that Judas was a devil. Exactly. And I, and I say that, I say that just to say that, you know, you can have someone to say, mm, you know, these people who, who believe in, you know, losing salvation, oh, look, look at how that person lived. Oh, you, you know that person I saved, or, or you know that person lost, lost his salvation. Oh, but look at that person. That person's definitely saved. That, and the thing of it is, the most we can do is make an approximation, but only God truly knows who's a who's a believer. So rather than just saying, "Okay, yeah, you're saved," you're not. You know, the most you can do is go off of what a person says, how they live their life, and if a person says that they believe in Christ. And you're going to have different levels of maturity. I believe um, Paul, when he's talking to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, I want to say, um, he's, he's saying how you're going to have uh, different vessels in a great house. And he says you're going to have basically these cups or plate that are made of gold and silver and then others of wood and of earth. And I believe he was talking about the he was talking about the maturity of believers and he was basically rearing up Timothy to say, listen, as a young man who's a believer, who's getting ready to evangelize out here, this is the type of things you want to mimic as a believer, because this is going to witness to your testimony when you're going out preaching, because not all believers are going to be as mature as we all should be. So I feel like there's actually a uh, biblical support and precedence that shows that you're going to have believers that are 
on fire and mature. And then you're going to have some believers that, you know, just aren't as mature, but it doesn't negate the fact that they are still believers. It just, just the fact that they still have some growing to do as we all do. Absolutely. Uh, that's a great point. Uh, uh, it's like, um, you know, I, I, uh, by chance, I came across one of your videos and I saw what you're preaching. And so that's why I reached out to you because not because I think you're saved or not saved or whatever, but because of right. what you preach. And, and to your point, you can't know if somebody's saved or not saved, but you can know what they preach or what they believe and those exactly. sorts of things. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, that's great stuff. That's good stuff right there. Um, was there something else? Uh, there was probably a, something I wanted to add and then I just forgot. Uh, so let me ask you, Sean, a question here. Um, so this, uh, gentleman here, I don't know if you can see the screen, but he says, my little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if, not when any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Then he quotes John 9, verse 31. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. So my question would be, uh, I think this gentleman is saying that if you sin, you're going to hell. And right. obviously... Um, the, the problem is, uh, you know, the example I like to give, well, you know, I was 30, um, what was I, 31 years old when I first got saved. What if I would have got saved when I was 15? I'd be in all kinds of trouble because when I was 15, I was full <laughs> of adrenaline and you, whatever else, right? So I, right, right. I would have there would have been a greater chance of me to sin when I was 15 than let's say if I wait till I'm 85 years old and on my deathbed, that would be the best time to be saved be mm -hmm. if that were the case, because mm -hmm. uh, I'm not, you know, I'm going to be old in years and not as likely to commit the kind of sins I would when I was 15. So right. um, when this gentleman here, he quotes these two Bible verses and both of them are right and they don't contradict. There is no contradiction in the Bible whatsoever. So right. when he says here in verse 31, now we know that God hears not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. So the question I would have is, what is the will that's being described here in John 9, 31? What is the will that doeth his will? What is his will what is god's will for us right do you have an answer for that sean yeah so um in i believe it's john 6 40 christ says that the will of the father is to believe in the one whom he sent and he was referring to himself oh so, say that hold on a second sean say that again i love that answer right there Okay. And, uh, yeah, that was a great answer. So what is the will of God that we should do? Yeah, yeah, it comes out of John 640. And, you know, Christ, he's saying that the will of the Father is to believe in the one whom he sent. And he's referring to himself. So I believe when we read scripture, there are certain aspects that we need to be sensitive to. Because I believe you have a a will of God for just all men, all, you know, uh, Christ said he came not to save the godly, but the ungodly. So I believe there is a will that God has for the, all the ungodly. And then I also believe that there is a will. Once you are a believer, there's a, a will of God for believers. Like for instance, um, I want to say it was, I can't remember exactly who said, who said it, but they said that it is the will of God for us to, uh, give thanks in all things uh, in Christ Jesus. And, you know, that is something that would be, you know, uh, something for a believer to do, you know, not an unbeliever. If, you know, if you're, if you're an unbeliever, you're not, you know, giving thanks to God in the name of Christ Jesus. So when it comes to that particular will of God, you know, I believe that that is, you know, referring to 
believing on him. That is the will for us to, to be redeemed, to be washed, to be justified. And then, so when he makes this connection with uh, 1 John 2, I want to, I want to say that was on the screen. It was um, yeah, first John two, my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not, but if you right. do sin, uh, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Right. So what tends to happen is they will say, Okay, well, as long as you're doing the right thing, then you know, you won't be considered, you know, a child of the devil and you know do, you have Christ. The moment, the moment you do something wrong, now you know you're actually showing that hey, you're not a child of Christ because you know John simply says you know if you basically sin, you know you 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 can't sin if he abides in you. So it's it's funny the fact that when I see scriptures like these, my mind. The way the way my mind kind of processes things, if a person if a person already knows what to do, I think to myself, then why are these epistles even being written? Because you have a lot of these epistles that are sent out to exhort and to uh, rebuke and correct, but yet we still see, like in in First John two, he's referring to them as you know my dear little children. Well, that is a reference to those who are believers. Yet he's telling them, you know, this is how you need to uh, live your life as believers. And I believe that that is that is essentially what John is getting across. I don't believe John is necessarily saying as a believer, the moment you do something wrong, then you're just, hey, you're actually a child of the devil now. But, you know, once you repent. That, you know, now you're born again, again, you know, and it's almost like this <laughs> flip floppy kind of a, a flip floppy kind of a, a salvation, which I don't understand if Christ is the rock and where the and if our house is cemented in him and when the storms come, our house is not going to be moved. I don't understand how, you know, how you can still and yet that rock is moved. I thought the whole point of having our souls anchored in him as I believe is somewhere in Hebrews, Hebrews 10, I think. So, um, yeah, when 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 we see John talking about we have an advocate with the father, I believe what, what John is is saying is that all of those who are in Christ, all of those who are actually born again, they will Christ is always the mediator. At no point in time will a, per a person who is a believer, will Christ not be their mediator? So if that is the case, how is it that you can do something and Christ won't mediate for you? So he's always there with you, always, you know, in the way that John is, is describing it there. But they, people like to use that and say, well, you know, if you do something wrong, you're actually showing you're, you know, a child of disobedience. You're, you know, manifesting that you're a child of the devil. But like I said before, if you're born of an incorruptible seed, how can you ever revert back to being corrupted? So, you know, I, I honestly I honestly believe that John is is essentially just saying, listen. As believers, this is this is how you all need to be living, living. And it's not John saying, well, if you don't live a literal perfect life that, hey, now you're going to lose your salvation because there's a hundred percent success rate <laughs> of all man, believers and unbelievers alike sinning. And if that's the case then we're all considered children of disobedience. We're all manifesting that we're children of the devil, if that's the case. A person can be a believer and, and mess up, but they are not, they are not considered a, they are not considered a, a children or a child of the devil or the devil is their father 
Because why? Our, our identity is not, we're not identified but by what we do. Our nature is not identified by what, what we do. Our nature is identified by where we are born out of. So we're born out of Christ. Our nature is no longer a sinner, but we are referred to as saints. We're not children of wrath or children of disobedience. We are children of God. And there's plenty of scriptures of uh, children of God being disobedient. Peter, for example, he there's a number of times he's saying, as a believer, and at no time do we ever see Peter or, or Jesus in any way, shape, or form saying that, you know, Peter somehow lost his salvation or, you know, Peter would no longer be on the 12 uh, foundations of the New Jerusalem. Like, you know, we just don't see that. Right, exactly. That's an excellent point. Uh, we're, uh, you're lying to yourself if you think you're perfect that after you become saved. Mm-hmm. You're just not being honest with yourself. You can try to fool somebody, but you're not honest with yourself because we all, as long as you're in this flesh, you're gonna be, you're gonna have sin in your heart. Whether you, yeah. whether you break the law, whether you get caught, doesn't matter. It's still. Uh, I think it's uh, somewhere in Genesis. It says the the imaginations of the heart is evil since a man's youth or something to that effect. Yeah, yeah Genesis 8. Yeah, and uh, so the thing is now in Isaiah, it, it says it prophesies about Jesus and it calls him the prince of peace. Now, yeah. if you could lose your salvation, and believe me, a Dummy like me, if I could lose it, I would. I'd find a way to do it. I'd screw it up, me guaranteed. Too, me too. <laughs> but but you, how can you have peace thinking that at any moment, you know, some good-looking girl could walk by and you'd lose your salvation like that? Yes, uh, or or yes, whatever it yes. is that you're thinking. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you can't have any true peace that way. But Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And he, uh, he makes it known very uh, simply that I've come not to bring peace on earth. Um, the peace that he brings is in the heart. And knowing that once you're saved, you're not, you shouldn't have to worry at all about losing your salvation. In fact, it says that we have the seal of God on us. And um, time and time again, uh, it just to me... We shouldn't be worried about losing our salvation. We should be confident of this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day yes, of Christ. Yes, amen. So I think that's the, the difference really. Uh, I hate. I really do hate to see people worried. And, uh, you know, when I was a, I, I don't know, when I was a new believer, I didn't know... I didn't know anything. I didn't understand anything. All I knew is that I needed a Savior. I knew that Jesus Christ was the Lord. And I said, if you are who you are, then um, then I'm going to give it all to you. And uh, that's all I can do on my part. Yeah, right? that's, I was just going to say that. <laughs> that's all we can do. I was just going to say that. You picked the word right out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he's done all the work, right? So the more we dig into the Bible, we see how wonderful god is and how much he loves us right yeah i i agree and i you know i i always wonder how christ can literally do like everything that no other person can do and someone can still think that they they have another part to add to that and the part that we will add is a corrupted part i I tell people you're not going to come to God with a with a mixed bag of good and good works and bad works and think that that's going to fly. It's you're either perfect or you're not. There is no I don't care if you're 99 percent good. If God calls us to be holy and perfect, anything short of that is unacceptable. So, you know, Christ literally came born of a virgin, conceived with the Holy Spirit. He said he came to fulfill what was written of him in the law and the in the prophets and the Psalms, he came and died for sin, and then he rose again. And you mean to tell me there's still some other things that you think you're going to add to that? <laughs> no, uh-uh. it blows my mind. No, that's kind of arrogant, isn't it? 
arrogant to think that I can do better than Christ? Yeah, bit. or or think it, and think you have to you you have to add something to it. And I think what happens is they think, oh, you know, you think all you gotta do is just believe, and you know that's good. You mean to tell me you there's nothing you have to do, and you can just and then they will give these super <laughs> these like super sins or super like super to say you mean you you can go and 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 kill a hundred thousand people yeah. and yeah. And do this and do they always give the, the really super extreme worst case examples. scenarios. Yeah, to say you mean you can do this and 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 not lose your salvation. And you know, I essentially, you know, I, I, I tell people, I said, you know, look, you can never lose your salvation. I said the question is not whether or not you can lose it. The question is, were you a believer to begin with? Right. You know, it's not can you lose it. The most you can say is, okay, did this person, you know, believe in the gospel? Right. So, but but still, regardless, whatever you do, you can't lose it. So if a person, if a person does go off the deep end, then, you know, they are still considered a child. How Whatever that deep end is to whatever that person is describing it, at the judgment seat, they're going to have a lot of works that burn up. But they that's themselves are going to be saved, according to Paul. That's right. That's right. Um, you know, like, um, what was it, David? Uh, am I thinking of the right one? He had uh, he had one of his best friends killed so he could take his yeah, wife. Yeah, yeah. Is that enough to lose your salvation? Right, exactly. Right. Yeah, he... Like, he you know, an adulterous affair, baby out of wedlock, conspired the murder of, like you said, Uriah, all of that. You know, I think he even tried to get the man drunk when he came back uh, from the battle, if I'm not mistaken, to to try to make it seem like the baby was his. So he's doing all of this cover up. And yet, yeah. you know, at, at no point do we ever see about, you know, David, quote unquote, not being considered righteous or you know, he's just just like anyone with children. I have children. If my children are disobedient, it don't it doesn't reverse the nature of them. <laughs> They're gonna be my child regardless, regardless yeah, of what forever. they do. Now you love you love your children, right? So exactly. what if your child what if your child does something wrong? Right. Well, shoot. Just like uh in Hebrews, um, you know, the father chastised those he loved. Yeah, those he loves, yes. Right. So your child does something, you know, you love them to chastise them, correct them, but that doesn't make them. The reason they're your child is because they're born of you, not because they work to be your child and now they're working to stay your child. That, you know, nobody will believe that in the physical, so why are we believing that in the spiritual? Yeah, 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 that's a good point. So look, Let's say one of your uh, children, they, they go into the kitchen and they eat all the cookies. Are you going to stop being their dad? I, You're not going to stop being their dad just because they eat all the cookies, right? Right, right. I couldn't, I couldn't stop being their dad even if I wanted to, if they're born of me. <laughs> right. Even if I wanted to, they're born of me, you know, um, and sometimes with parents and kids, sometimes, a re- you know, you can have a strained relationship. But regardless, you you are your parent's child, no matter h- how good or how bad a relationship. You're going to be their, their child no matter what, because you're born of them. You're a seed of them. That's that's right. That's a very good point. And it's a very good example for us in life, uh, especially when you become a parent. You realize how much you do love your child. And if you love your child, how much more does God love you? Right? Exactly. I can't I can't imagine to say, well, you're so disobedient. Well, I don't want to be your father. I don't want to be your mother anymore. I mean, you know, if you if you feel like you have to do some tough love, if they get really out of hand, that's you know, one thing, but you know, no matter what, that love is unconditional. I don't love you because 
of what you do. I love just I love you because of who you are. Right. Exactly. You you don't love your children because they saved you a cookie. You love them. Right. You love them no matter. What. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Exactly. So I've taken up the, enough of your time, Sean. I really do appreciate you joining me today, and uh, maybe uh, we could do this again in the future. Oh yeah, no, I I appreciate you reaching out, and uh, I've I always love when I have the opportunity to fellowship with uh, someone who's like minded because it's, you know, sometimes you, you know, debating can, I don't know about you, but sometimes if I'm going back and forth with a person online or talking to them, it can, it can kind of, kind of wear me out. So when you can talk to someone who's like minded is so refreshing and you can kind of be relaxed. So yes, I really do appreciate this opportunity that you've given me to, to discuss these things with you. Yes, and yes sir. I would love to do it in the future. Yes. Okay, you've been fantastic, Sean. I appreciate it, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day, okay? Okay, I appreciate you. God bless. Yep.